improvisation is the making up of music on the fly, without any written instruction. It has been a big part of music from the beginning of history and continues to flourish in the jazz idiom today. In this video, we will take a tour of improvisation through music history and see how it functions in every time period. Music before written records is hard to study. There are a few glimpses into how classical Greeks performed, and the consensus was that performances were improvised. An instrument, like a kitara, would give a singer a chord, and then they would declare the text using a combination of speech and song, making up the melody as they went along. The first textual instance of improvisation comes from Europe in the medieval period. A treatise from the ninth century instructs singers on how to improvise a second melody above a pre-existing liturgical chant in the style chord organum. Music education at the time also included the improvisation of counterpoint over a cantus firmus or a pre-existing melody. The technique was used in church and dance music of the time. Thanks to music printing, we have more evidence of improvisation being taught in the Renaissance, thanks to 16th century Italian instructional manuals. In in addition to improvising counterpoint of a cantus firmus, singers and instrumentalists were trained to embellish melodic lines with ornaments, improvise melodies over ostinato or repeating chord patterns, and invent music extemporaneously. In the Baroque period, the main improvisation that was added to the ranks was for organists and keyboardists. Organists would improvise chorale preludes based on chorale settings of Gregorian chant in the various parts of the masses. Other forms included variations or partite, written on borrowed themes, the chacon and the passagalia, a ritornello or a short intermental refrain improvised over a short and repeating chord progression. The the most famous practitioner of the organ improvisation was J.S. Bach. He was known all over the world for his ability to take a theme from an audience and create a pr prelude and fugue around the subject. Let's hear a Bach chorale prelude, Wachet auf Runs uns die Stimme, based on the Lutheran hymn of the same name. You can hear how Bach takes the melody and creates a bass line and a secondary theme to complement the hymn. Bach would create these preludes on the fly, then write them down or compose them each week for the church. Improvising at the organ became a performance in the late Baroque. Handel was known for improvising on a theme during intermissions of his oratorios in London. The tradition of improvising at the keyboard continued in the classical period. Both Mozart and Beethoven were talented improvisers, impressing patrons at parties with their ability to take a theme from a guest and improvise a fugue or a sonata on the fly. They would also participate in improvisatory battles with other musicians, seeing which one could create a better work of art using a prescribed melody. Beethoven won many such a battle against his rivals, such as Johann Nepomuk Hummel, Daniel Steinbelt, and Joseph Wolfel, all virtuosic pianists in their own right. Beethoven left a record of many of his improvisations by writing them down after creating them and publishing them. We have many of the variation sets and sonatas that he published that show us a record of what his improvisational style was like. Let's hear an improvisation of Beethoven's, the introduction to his choral fantasy Opus 80. Beethoven was so consumed with the preparations for the first performance in 1808, he forgot to write an introduction to the work. On the day of the concert, he sat down and improvised one.
You can hear how Beethoven creates excitement and tension based on the chord progression. He takes a wild tour through tonalities using closely related chords to create turbulence, setting up the chorale fantasy excellently. The artists of the Romantic period continued Beethoven's legacy at the keyboard. During concerts, artists would extemporaneously create preludes, interludes, and other connecting material between and around the works featured on the program. Great improvisationalists of the period were Franz Liszt, Felix Mendelssohn, Anton Rubinstein, and Frederick Chopin. Liszt was also known for his transcriptions of other composers' works, like Beethoven's symphonies or Schubert songs. These had their beginnings as improvised works th that were then written down and published. Improvisation in classical music seemed to die down due to the advent of recording. Hearing a performer improvise their own cadenzas is almost unheard of today. Luckily, the tradition lives on in jazz music. Jazz grew out of the ragtime traditions in New Orleans around the turn of the 20th century. The melting pot of traditions, including African traditions from enslaved peoples, the rhythms of the Caribbean and Haitian immigrants, and the brass bands of European descent all had a part in the birth of jazz. The first style of jazz was the New Orleans or Dixieland style, comprising of a band that includes a piano, drums, and bass, and a front line of instruments that depended on what the performance were available for the gig. Usually it would include a trumpet, trombone, and clarinet. Each one of the frontline musicians was responsible for improvising their line at the same time as the rest of the musicians, leading to a group improvisation. The rest of the band would play the chords of whatever song they were ornamenting, keeping everyone in a tonal center. This group improvisation was a hallmark of Dixieland jazz. Let's hear some of it now. Dixieland Jazz Band. As you could see, there were many instrumentalists on stage playing at the same time as one another. This group improvisation creates a sophisticated riff off the song they are playing. Improvisation continued on in jazz as it grew in popularity and prestige. In the big band era, one of the best improvisers on the scene was Louis Armstrong. He played his trumpet and sang in scat to improvise his way around a jazz tune. Improvisation is now a standard feature in all jazz performances. They usually have the band or a few instruments playing a repeating chord structure or progression while a single instrument solos over the top. Let's take a look at one of these solos now. Eric Marenthal plays a saxophone solo at the beginning of Heart and Soul by Johnny Green. starts off by playing some interpreted chords and the saxophone comes in with an improvised melody. It is an embellishment of the song melody. Improvisation is alive and well in jazz today, but stretches all the way back to the beginning of music. It was a primary form of entertainment and prestige for accomplished soloists of all generations and helped launch the careers of many. 
Thank you for joining me today as we talked about improvisation. I had a great time putting this together for you. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of my other videos about music. You can also support the creation of these videos on Patreon. A link is in the description box below. Also in the description box is the link to my bibliography for this video hosted on my website dominicroyam.com. Let's continue the conversation on social media. My handle is Dominique Royam on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Thanks so much and see you in my next video.